Hey guys, what's going on here? Uh, I just uh, wanted to do another autobiography for you really good. And uh, I know all of them right now are, are uh, <coughs> of the professional wrestlers. And I've got several of them on, uh, <coughs> on some rock and roll legends. But, uh, but I just, these are my favorite ones. And, and so I'm going to recommend, recommend them to you guys. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, I'm a nerd and uh, that's what I do. I, I pick these things out and, uh, and I give them to you guys. You're welcome. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, the book I want to review to you today is a very, very easy read. Not very long at all. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you, it, it, and it's also kind of, it's kind of co-wrote, so, you know, <clears throat> so it's not exactly all in the fashion of Mick Foley and, uh, and Chris Jericho where they actually did it all themselves. But, uh, this, this autobiography right here came out with a DVD, uh, an accompanying DVD set, and it is one of my all-time favorite, <clears throat> favorite professional wrestlers. And, uh, I mean, this guy has got a story like none other. I mean, if you want to talk about unique stories, some of these guys that make up the old, old days of professional wrestling back when I was growing up, uh, these guys got stories that that would make you uh, that that would make you uh, uh, be scared at night. Uh, you know, I mean, you guys think that uh, you know going to your little Taco Bell jobs out there and going to the park and walking to your car in the in the dark of night, uh, and, and you think that's kind of scary. You know, that's that's the most exciting excitement that you've had uh, that that your day has. <clears throat> but these guys. Uh, that's why I have so much uh, respect for these uh, uh, professional wrestlers, uh, the ones today, and and especially the ones of, of yesteryear when I was growing up back in the 80s. Uh, these guys, uh, that right there would have been a cakewalk for them. I mean, these guys were out there by themselves in some of the most inhospitable places in the world, and uh, and they're still around to talk about it. Uh, and and so I mean. Uh, that's what makes their autobiography so fascinating to me is because they're not the usual oh well I grew up and and then I went ahead and I, I, sub I submitted my script and and eventually somebody picked it up and took a chance on me and then my book got published or something like this I mean <clears throat> which is a great story don't get me wrong but I mean you want to talk about the American dream or whatever it was uh, uh, professional wrestlers or the guys in the, the interesting characters that that made up that industry uh, these guys uh, <clears throat> it was an amazing I mean you talk about being on the road 340 something days out of the year uh, you think you had a crappy job uh, anyways but uh, like I said it makes their unique story so fascinating to read because not not two one of them are the same. They're all unique. And most importantly, it gives you, the reader, a very, very new understanding and appreciation for your life and your situation and, and a new perspective uh, without having to, to get stabbed uh, like some of these guys did. Uh, but anyways, the book I'm going to review is the autobiography of Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, In the Pit with Piper. Uh, uh, where Roddy gets rowdy, and uh, basically that's named after his famous uh, segment that he did, uh, 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 most infamous really, uh, with Robert, uh, with Robert Downey at WrestleMania Five, uh, Piper's Pit, where he crashed a coconut over the aforementioned uh, Jimmy Superfly Snuka in a segment, and all these great things. If you look back over wrestling's history, <clears throat> and if you look back at the guys that shaped it. Uh, I'm telling you, yeah, there's the, you know, there's the, there's the Hulk Hogan's, yeah, uh, there's the, there's the Nature Boy Ric Flair's, yeah, uh, there, there's a few others, but uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, as far as talking, as far as, uh, as far as uh, ring psychology, Jake the Snake Roberts, untouchable. Uh, but I'll guarantee you, <clears throat> there would have never been a rock and wrestling uh, deal that started back in the 80s. There probably, there probably would not have been a WrestleMania 
and we wouldn't have been standing here 30 years later even talking about WrestleMania 30 if it, if, if, it, if, it, if it hadn't have been for this guy right here, Rowdy Roddy Piper. That's right. Now, I never had anything against Hulk Hogan, but I'll guarantee you, man, at WrestleMania 3, this little nerd had him a hot rod shirt on while I was watching Rowdy Roddy Piper's retirement match at the time when he walked down that ramp at the Pontiac Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan. Now, that was all fine and dandy when Hulk Hogan slammed Andre. It was great. But for years truly, I was a little old five-year or six-year-old boy with tears in my eyes because I thought that was the last time that I was going to see the Hot Rod. Now, let me tell you something. This guy's book was amazing. He was an orphan. And I'm going to tell you this. On my mother's side, I'm Scottish. So right away, me and this Roddy Roddy Piper guy, we, we hit it off. I immediately connected with this guy because he came to the ring and nobody else had ever did this before. He came to the ring playing bagpipes. He was an orphan. He was walking up and down the streets. He didn't have a home. And that's another reason why these guys are so awesome. And his only gimmick at the time was setting up the ring and, and helping these guys, uh, you know, as a referee. And so he, the only way that he could get a place on the card so that he could get maybe 4 or $5 a week and get paid was he would come out to the ring using his Scottish ancestry and he would play the bagpipes at intermission. That's right. And that's how he got a job. And that's how he broke in. And uh, finally... Finally, they decided to let him be a wrestler because people would ask about the guy that played the bagpipes. The little kid, the little snot-nosed 16 or 17-year-old kid that didn't have a family. He didn't have a mother. He didn't have a father. The only person he had, it was him, his wits, and, uh, and his bagpipes. And let me tell you, it wasn't easy. That's why I have a big amount of respect for Roddy Roddy Piper. And I remember when he first got his start, he was sleeping out under the Canadian sky on a rock in the middle of, I don't know if you guys ever ever know about Calgary, Alberta, but if you remember Stampede Wrestling, the whole area, the, the territory of Stampede Wrestling spanned all the way down from Alberta, you know, from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, all the way down into, into Montana and all these places. In the winter, it's horrible. And Roddy Roddy Piper would sleep out under the stars on a rock in the middle of the night because the car broke down and he didn't have anywhere else to go. Yeah. Yeah. You think you had it bad. And he never complained. And, uh, and the thing about it is, is, I mean, he finally got his break. He was the kid that played the bagpipes, you know. <clears throat> and so he, he, he got his break in professional wrestling and uh, you know he, 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 could, he got kicked out of school after school after school he was an orphan he was a journeyman uh, that's all he could do he journeyed from one place to the next he, he never could fit in uh, he, he would get a, he never could follow the rules he was just he was just one of those people that just couldn't quite fit into the to the system. He he hated the system. He didn't really like it that people would always make up rules that he couldn't follow, uh, and that was another reason why I liked him. He was a journeyman, uh, and so finally uh, he found a family in professional wrestling, and these oddball people became his family, and uh, so you know he he made it there and. Uh, he went on the road like these these long cold nights <clears throat> finally becoming a wrestler and getting a chance and and uh, and the only thing he could do was he, he was kind of like me he was a smart aleck you know so he used his mouth and he used the wits that he yearned, he learned as a kid on the streets being street smart he learned how to do that to make it his way into professional wrestling and uh, he talked his way all the way into there all the way down into the Los Angeles territory 
after after breaking in and doing the the you know it, the the big you know where he first got started in he finally made it out to LA where he first started making his mark in the business and we, he got into it with the Hispanic population down there because he found out that he could really really tick people off and get them to come down there and see him by using his mouth and so he this was the first time that he used the he employed the tactic of of, 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 of the media and which would later catapult into Wrestlemania uh, but he, he, he ticked off the local uh, Hispanic media by saying some derogatory things to get them heated up. And, and he got people so mad that people would come to the arena. And, and when he would get dumped over the guardrail, uh, you know, he had one guy stab him several times. Uh, and, of course, he shrugged it off because that's just the nature of the business in professional wrestling. Uh, but, you know, people finally started, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, uh, taking consideration of this guy. And, uh, you know, so he finally got hired by one of his favorite promoters, which is uh, uh, Roddy Piper lives in Portland, Oregon uh, now. But uh, after they seen the mark that he was making in L.A. down there at the old historic L.A. Uh, Sportatorium, uh, a guy up there in Portland uh, hired him to come up to the uh, Portland Territory. And, of course, this is where Piper lives now. Uh, but, you know, and this was his favorite promoter. And so he went back up there, and he helped that guy out. And Piper was making a good living, you know, not truly really good, but he, he finally started getting a, he, he, found a, he found a wife, he kind of got a family started, and, uh, and then finally he got the call to come down to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, which was, back then, that was the big, one of the big territories, uh, Charlotte. Now that was, uh, that was uh, Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, one of the big leagues, what would eventually become WCW, and uh, and uh, so Piper moved his family, got his kids all the way down here. Didn't have very much to his name. He just moved them on a whim because he he's one of those guys. Hey, I'll pack up and move, you know. So he went to the territory, and people he found out about the politics in professional wrestling. People holding him down, and and you'll find out some of that in there, and uh, and you'll meet how he come into contact with the. Uh, uh, with uh, the Nature Boy and uh, and uh, and and, and uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in the early years there in the in the late 70s, uh, when when the Nature Boy and, and, and uh, years before the Nature Boy and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat would battle for world titles, the they were battling for the United States Championship back in uh, at, at Jim Crockett Promotions when 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 Roddy Roddy Piper arrived, and. Uh, so you, he'll take you through that whole process, the whole politics of the situation, uh, uh, you know, the the finally uh, getting into some awesome, awesome classic feuds with uh, with uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine, the the infamous dog collar match. Uh, Roddy Piper takes you all the way through that situation right there. Uh, he goes into you know back right before this where he uh, he thought he was going to get to debut for McMahon back in the in the WWF, but but that kind of went our way, and he learned he learned firsthand uh, some wrestling terminologies and what ribbing on the square meant. Uh, you know, a little bit of deal for you there. Uh, but anyways, like I said, he takes you through the classic dog collar matches against him and Greg the Hammer Valentine, and and then of course you're you're right there on the seat of, on on the edge of your seat as of course um, uh, Vince McMahon Jr comes into control of the WWWF and it becomes a Titan's powers and and he purchases the rights uh, f from his father and he starts acquiring and raiding all these territories and and basically dismantling the territory system and becoming what we know today as the WWE uh, Vince McMahon starts acquiring all this talent and making a super roster and taking over national uh, syndication and Roddy Piper takes you ha first hand account on, on, on in the locker room and all these people and what they're thinking about you know him right there with Andre the Giant and and some of the greats like Bobby the Brain Heen and Gene Okerlund uh, uh, you know got Arnold's uh, you know Arnold's calling uh, all these guys in the break room Greg the Hammer Valentine Paul Orndorff uh, 
Hulk Hogan, all these guys and their thoughts on what's going on and what Vince McMahon was doing at the time and if they thought it was going to work. And, and then it goes right on into the, the rock and wrestling situation where Piper once again used his skills to with the Cindy Lauper thing and Captain Lou Albano getting an award and, and him having, uh, you know, working with MTV and, and getting people so ticked off that he would shove Cindy Lauper and, and then the whole heat that he got worldwide and all of a sudden wrestling was hot and, and Hulk Hogan and then the rise of Hulk Hogan and then everybody hating Hulk, uh, uh, Roddy Piper and wanting Hulk Hogan to kick his butt so bad and then we finally get WrestleMania, the first one. And the war to settle the score, uh, but you know between Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan, and, and and Roddy Piper once again tells you step by step the whole process, taking you up to what was supposed to be his retirement match at WrestleMania three, and then going on commentary with Vince McMahon, and uh, his comments on uh, on uh, Vince McMahon and 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 how Vince McMahon kind of you know and working with Roddy Piper. Uh, on, on commentary on some of those old WWF Coliseum video releases and 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 and, and play-by-plays and how that was going, and then right into the steroid scandal of 1991 uh, that that uh, that Vince McMahon was hit, and and the fallout between that Vince McMahon, Hulk Hogan, uh, uh, and and Roddy Piper was right there at it. Uh, and I mean, he 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 doesn't hold any punches. Roddy Piper never did, and uh, but and he tells you all about it. In this book, and then also he also throws in some great things about uh, going into Puerto Rico. And it's a great story about him and Ric Flair over there in Puerto Rico, where they 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 had uh, the, the they got people so worked up in a Puerto Rican uh, 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 wrestling match that that uh, they were storming the the arena to get in the dressing room to to kill Roddy Piper and Ric Flair. They had to back an ambulance up to the back of the dressing room to 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 sneak. Uh, you know, to, to, to transport Ric Flair and Roddy Piper out in an ambulance just to get them out of the arena because people were trying to kill them so bad. He, they got the crowd so ticked off. Uh, that's how it was back in the day. All these stories and more, guys, go out and get this book. It, it is, it's almost uh, maybe 300 pages. Uh, it's, it's in the pit with Piper. Uh, it's, uh, you know, Rowdy gets Roddy. Uh, the Rowdy Roddy Piper story, you will, uh, this thing, you will blink and it will be gone. I highly recommend it. From my bookshelf to yours, happy